the March 9th, 2020 County Commission meeting. I'm gonna ask our Sheriff John Fuson to call our meeting to order. Please remain standing for the pledge led by Commissioner Loretta Bryant and our invocation by our Chaplain Commissioner Joe Creek. All right. Oh yes, oh yes, this Honorable Board of County Commissioners is now in session pursuant to adjournment. Now may God save this state and this Honorable I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your love and your wise care. We thank you for our legislative body and how you blessed us with the leadership here in Montgomery County. We pray for those that are in need, those that are suffering illness from flu virus or whatever, and those that's been trying to recover from storm damage, we just pray that you'll be with them, guide and direct them. Again, we thank you for how you blessed us in many ways. It says in Psalms 136, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Lead, guide, and direct us now, of course, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Commissioners, if you would, please register your attendance. Ms. Jackson, would you please read the roll? I'm sorry, Ms. Cottrell. I apologize. All right. Our first item of business is our approval of our February 10th, 2020 minutes. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Rasnick, second. Commissioner Pritchard, any discussion? I'm gonna let y'all get that machine. You just tell me when you're ready. If you would please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? We have 21 yeses, zero noes, and zero abstentions. We have a f three proclamations tonight. Uh, if I could get Miss Rebecca Norman uh, from our Ag Extension Office to come forward, please, ma'am. And I think you have some of your folks with you, so just bring them right on, Miss Rebecca. So this is a proclamation by the county mayor. Whereas Tennessee Cooperative Extension helps Tennessee to improve their quality of life and solve problems through the application of research and evidence-based knowledge about agriculture and natural resources, family and consumer sciences, 4-H youth development and community development. And whereas Tennessee Cooperative Extension provides a gateway to the University of Tennessee and to Tennessee State University and is a statewide educational organization funded by federal, state, and local government to serve people where they live and work. And whereas Tennessee Cooperative Extension is part of a national system, which includes educational and research resources of the USDA, 74 land grant universities, and 3,150 country units throughout the nation county units, I'm sorry, whereas approximately 1,600 professional extension agents employed in counties across America are teaching citizens how to have better homes, farms, and communities. 400 of these extension professionals live and work in Tennessee, where they initiate, create, and conduct educational programs for people who want to help themselves to an improved quality of life. And whereas challenges facing Tennessee's young people are greater than ever before, and Tennessee Extension 4-H Youth Development Programs helps youth from 9 to 19 to develop self-esteem, leadership, and citizenship skills and gain knowledge in a wide range of subjects. And whereas Tennessee Extension had 4.3 million educational contacts with a $9.88 return on every $1 invested and a total of 484 million annual economic impact. Now, therefore, I, Jim Durrett, on behalf of Montgomery County, Tennessee, and its great citizens, 
do hereby pro proclaim March as Tennessee Cooperative Extension Month and ask all residents to join me as we commend the Montgomery County Extension Office for their dedication and valuable service towards the betterment of our community. Mr. Rebecca and staff, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank And if I could have Miss Taylor Albertia come forward, please. And if you'd like to bring uh, anybody with you, you're welcome to do that. I'm busy. Okay, good. <laughs> Taylor, how are you? I'm good. How are you? So this is a proclamation by the county mayor. Whereas the Governor's Volunteer Star Award is a statewide recognition program instituted by former Governor Phil Bredesen to honor and publicly recognize citizens from each county for their exemplary volunteer service to their community. And whereas Taylor Gr Janine Janae, Taylor Janae Alberta has been awarded the honor as the 2019 Montgomery County Youth Recipient for her active volunteer experiences throughout Montgomery County. And whereas Taylor has re was recently recognized with the President's Volunteer Service Award Ward for having completed more than 300 hours of volunteer service within a calendar year. And whereas Taylor has been an active member of Junior Civitan International for approximately six years, currently serving as a Valley District Junior Governor, where she led her district in making blessing bags for local police officers after hearing about the 21st officer shot and killed just for wearing a uniform. Under her direction, 40 junior civitans came together in 2019 to make 150 blessing bags full of snacks, first aid items, and personal notes of encouragement to present to local law enforcement. Additionally, Taylor is involved in various civitan projects as well as raising over $20,000 for civitan international research. And whereas Taylor serves as an ambassador for Lead United with Clarksville United Way, a Montgomery County Mayor's emerging leader, all while maintaining high academic, high academic standards and serving on her school's yearbook staff. And whereas Taylor also makes the time to volunteer as a music camp leader and to mentor for those with special needs. She visits nursing homes and participates in food and clothing drives to help those who are less fortunate. Taylor has a true heart for serving her community. Now, therefore, I, Jim Durrett, Mayor of Montgomery County, Tennessee, do hereby encourage all citizens to join me in recognizing Taylor Alberta for her volunteer work in Montgomery County. Her volunteer spirit serves as an inspiration to us all. Taylor, thank you. We need to be more like you. We do. You want to come up? You're welcome to come up and take a picture. If I could have Mr. Gary Norris come forward, please. And you're welcome to bring Miss Joyce. Good evening. If you would allow me to read this last proclamation by the county mayor, whereas the Governor's Volunteer Star Award is a statewide recognition program instituted by former Governor Phil Bredesen to honor and publicly recognize citizens from each county for their exemplary volunteer service in their community. Whereas Gary Norris has been awarded the honor as the 2019 Montgomery County Adult Recipient for his longtime commitment and passion of helping families in our community have an affordable, decent home and for his support of housing in Montgomery County. And whereas Gary worked to institute the Clarksville Home Builders Association in the 1980s and served in several different capacities 
on the board through the years. He has worked to establish scholarship for students at Austin Peay State University and donations for Clarksville Montgomery County School System. And whereas Gary Norris, after meeting with Herb Baggett about Habitat for Humanity in 1992, was sold on the concept of helping low-income families through the program. Through his business, Red River Block and Supply, he provided the material to build the first home at no charge and continued to freely donate materials at no cost and deeply discounted costs for Habitat Homes until he sold the company in 2002. In 2004, Gary joined the Board of Directors for the local Habitat for Humanity, where he served on the board for 12 years and served as chairman for two years. And whereas Gary Norris has been giving back to Clarksville Montgomery County for nearly four decades by volunteering his time and talents to many local nonprofit and civic organizations, Gary served on the City Board of Zoning Appeals, Montgomery County Historic Zoning Commission, and Common Design Review Board, Montgomery County Regional Planning Commission, Montgomery County Board of Zoning and Appeals, and the Clarksville Chamber of Commerce. Gary also serves as an elder at First Presbyterian Church. And whereas Gary Norris believes everyone should become involved in their community, giving back to the community that has done so much to give to individuals and families over the years. Gary decided in 2019 to, to, to continue giving back to the community by filling the void of an elected official position where he was appointed to the Clarksville City Council where he continues working with Clarksville and Montgomery County. Now therefore I, Jim Durrett, Mayor of Montgomery County, Tennessee, do hereby encourage all citizens to join me in recognizing Gary Norris for his longtime dedication in making meaningful, meaningful contributions to the people of Montgomery County. Gary, thank you so much. Commissioners, we have a couple of presentations tonight. If I could get Mr. Joey Smith uh, to Montgomery County Community Health Assessment. Joey, good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. For over 115 years, the Tennessee Department of Health has been collecting birth and death certificate data. Uh, prior to the internet, uh, this was one of the best ways that we could track the number of births, but also get ahead of an epidemic uh, in the early 1900s. And we've been looking at that data every year, and of course many of you have, uh, I've talked with you and you've been in presentations uh, where, uh, where I'm talking about it, and I present on it each year, but about every five years we do something special which is a community health assessment where we present the data with a strategic plan to capture those top things that are killing us, uh, those leading influencers that are leading to those uh, deaths. Uh, and we use that to build into our strategic plan, but also our community, uh, uh, our, our Montgomery County uh, Health Council also develops action steps based on, on this data. But before I capture the voice of citizens and stakeholders, I'd like to show a few slides. There we go. If I would have went out to ask citizens what are the top three biggest issues, uh, especially this week, their answer probably wouldn't be surprising of, of what they think the biggest issues are. And so when we look at uh, what the media covers, typically homicides and terrorism are covered over 70% of the time in the media of the cause of death. And heart disease is only covered about 2.5% of the time. But when we looked at what all of our citizens and ourselves are Googling, 
of, that's related to cause of death, we actually see something very, uh, very uh, um, uh, not surprising, but it, it, it lets us know that uh, this is a very important part. Uh, heart disease is Googled 2% of the time. But when looking nationally, uh, heart disease is 30% of all of our deaths. And so one of the very first things I like to share is the top causes of, of Montgomery County's leading causes of death. Now, we look at this over a four year period because that way there's not any outliers uh, statistically. And uh, uh, one reason why, or one assumption that we have that cancer is, is our leading cause of death, uh, uh, because we're one of the youngest counties in Tennessee, and out of 3,100 counties across the U.S., we are one of the top 200 youngest counties of median age in the United States. Uh, so we don't have a, a, a high rate of, of uh, uh, of citizens that are over 65 years old that are dying from heart disease at the rate of the national rate. Uh, but that's the top 33 causes of death, and I'll be glad to share this with you. But um, one thing I do want to say, just uh, two more slides from now, everyone have your smartphone out and have it on the camera app because there'll be a, a QR code where you can take of, uh, you can zoom in on, this, on the QR code and everyone here can actually participate in the, the survey. And you can save that link for later because I know you have business after this. Uh, when you pull up uh, the, the actual survey, you'll get to see all of these leading influencers of the, uh, that lead towards those top causes of death. And so you'll have the data right there at, the, at your fingertips. But one important thing that we like to do is, is capture that voice of the stakeholders, of our hospitals, of our, our government officials, uh, transportation, parks and rec, uh, uh, medical clinics, um, housing, uh, our, our, our loaves and fishes organizations. Uh, we want to hear those voices as a stakeholders and also capture this as a citizen. And you all are one of these stakeholders. And um, I appreciate your time. Uh, and there's your QR code right there. You can just, everyone here, if, if you'd like to participate in the survey, you just zoom in on that and a link will come up and you can click on that link and do the survey later. Um, or those in the audience can do the survey now uh, if, if you'd like to. But uh, there's a lot more uh, great presentations coming right after me. Uh, is there any questions? Any questions of Mr. Smith? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joey. Yes, sir. Appreciate all you do. Commissioners, next we have a presentation from Mr. Eric Horton with the Fort Campbell Strong Defense Alliance. I asked Mr. Horton uh, to, to brief you all. This is a program that uh, we're very involved in in Montgomery County, and I, I think Mr. Horton has some great information for you. Thank you, Mayor, for having me, and thank you, County Commissioners, for giving me the opportunity to brief you guys on the great things that Fort Campbell Strong is doing in this community. And some of this that I'd actually like to uh, highlight on this The importance of what happened with Campbell Strong and why we're actually in existence right now is because in September of 2018, Workforce Essentials, in partnership with the Northern Middle Tennessee Workforce Board and the Western Kentucky Workforce Board, recognized the impact with the sheer volume of, of soldiers that are transitioning out of the military from Fort Campbell. There's upwards of 7,000 veterans, or soldiers, that are transitioning out of Fort Campbell and staying and choosing to stay in a bunch of, diff bunch of different communities with Clarksville being one of the most predominant uh, communities to live into. But in addition to the amount of soldiers that are leaving to try to find a home where they're going to retire at forever, there's about 12,000 spouses that are residing on Fort Campbell. The big challenge with the reason why the grant came into place was to petition for a Department of Labor grant, which they were end up being awarded a $7.7 .7 million grant 
with the sole purpose of ensuring that every one of those up to 7,000 soldiers has a job and every one of the existing 10 to 12,000 spouses who nationwide are recognized to be 80% are either underemployed or unemployed have a pathway to employment, most notably to choose in because Fort Campbell is located and situated on two state borders between Kentucky and Tennessee, the challenges to get those soldiers employed has been immense. And so some of this is from a briefing that actually I prepared right around November of last year to kind of capture some of the challenges with not only industry not recognizing the value of those soldiers as they leave, as well as the qualities of the spouses that are currently on Fort Campbell with some of the most premier units that the you know, United States military has with 5th Special Forces Group and 160th as well as 101st. So this presentation was really to kind of talk to industry as well as to spread the word of what we can do for industry in this community with our grant. And the big thing that I want you to take away from this is the partnership that we actually have with Fort Campbell. We can reimburse or pay companies to hire veterans. Let me say that again. Not only can we pay the companies to hire the veterans, we can pay the companies to hire spouses of, that are 80% that are either underemployed or unemployed through this grant. We've been existent for about a year now, a little over a year. We stood up the building in January. We've helped roughly right around a little under 1,100 so far with a grant being looked at to, uh, to September 29th of this year. And then, but we'll capture some more of the data in this presentation as I go forward. It's no secret that when you employ veterans, there's a lot of qualities that comes with it, right? And so in Forbes in 2010 said, hey, these are, the top, these are some of the uh, top eight characteristics of what you get when you hire a veteran. And I'll capture more of the data with it on the qualifications of the soldiers as they leave, right? So they hire, what they said was you hire for effort, attitude, and values first, right? And nobody can, dis, uh, can, can say that that doesn't exist with the military that we kept, especially from Fort Campbell. After you found those three qualities in the candidate, then look at the skills, the expertise, and the experience. I can't tell you how many of my peers as we retire from the military have the exposure with multiple cultures, can speak in some degree or understand on multiple languages, and possibly have multiple certifications and or multiple degrees as we leave the military. The, the second thing is it hire for people's behaviors and value systems. Again, that's a quality that most military has and, and possesses. And it's something that's just not quite captured enough uh, from industry's understanding of that. You can always teach somebody a skill. And I always joke around and say I could teach my dog to ring a doorbell to go outside and go to the bathroom, right? So there's so much more that you get when you hire a veteran from that. So you can teach someone how to do a job, but it is much more difficult to teach somebody values, right? The 10 T traits of military veterans accelerated learning curve. While yes, they may not have industry experience on how to manufacture tires or work in a banking system, but they have the aptitude and the capability from the proven ability of theirs to be able to navigate and be promoted and learn new skills in the military. Most military members have been dual-hatted, cross-trained multiple times over. So that aptitude is what you look for. The second thing is leadership. There's no discussion on the quality of leadership that comes out of a retiring veteran that may have possibly two or three decorate, decades of leadership experience. I retired after 26 years, seven months, and 29 wonderful days. The leadership I learned from just not only from being taught, but also uh, projecting myself is pair, uh, pale in comparison to some of the veterans that I see in the community tonight and some of the veterans that are in this room right now. Teamwork. We've had to work in some teamwork in some of the most austere environments uh, under multiple cultural effects and impacts. Diversity, inclusion, and action. I've had to work alongside many different cultures, many different uh, ethnicities, many different races and genders. And so that right there is a, is a key that uh, some of the qualities and the candors and the training that we've actually had to have as we navigated some of these spheres of influence and diversity inclusion. Efficient performance under pressure. Again, getting the job done when it needs to get done, nobody goes home until it is, right? That's been instilled with us since day one in the military. You can't hire for that that often. It just comes with the military's experience and decades that some of us have as we retire and transition out of the military. Respect for procedures, it's no secret. The Army runs on procedures, standard operating procedures. 
uh, technology and globalization. I know from almost the three decades of the military that I've had, the last five years of my military service, the technology that I've seen that was implemented in the military is mind-blowing. To, to include the GCSSA, or what they called the government logistics system, which wanted real-time reporting from a soldier that could be in Afghanistan that is ordering for a part to be repaired for a Black Hawk. Where was it ordered from? Where was it manufactured from? And where is the process in delivery if it's being shipped by barge or plane right now at this moment? So the integrity piece of it, doing what is right all the time, no matter what the situation or the agenda is, right? Conscious of health and safety standards, every duty station that I went to amongst my years, I always had to be taught and trained on first responders, the procedures you need to do to be able to administer life-saving first aid to your battle buddy, to your left or to your right, uh, was top-notch and some of the best that I think is out there today. And, and it's been proven with the amount of reduced casualties that we've had on the battlefield uh, compared to what we had in the 1970s with Vietnam. And so triumph over adversity. Every given time, no matter what deployment or what year, what uh, area of the country or the world that you're in, you always had the opportunity to face adversity, but with your team that you went together and came back from, you were able to triumph over it and come back with a clear conscience and a peace of mind, right? So these are some of the 10 skills that I wished industry heard more often instead of some of the blanket statements uh, that we've seen uh, that are narratives across the spectrum and broadcasted. These are the 10 qualities, the reason why you need to encourage the industry to hire more veterans. I don't even want to talk about the, cat, the piece of spouses that have the more entrepreneurial spirit than most people out in the entrepreneur startups. I, I can speak from experience. My wife personally started and exited three uh, startups uh, at different duty stations at different locations. That's just one person. But all of her friends did the exact same thing degreed, graduate degreed professionals that had to change jobs and either be unemployed or, as in my wife's case, a teacher that was told that they had the maximum amount of teachers at that institution that she could go work at Anthony's Pizza. Broke her heart. That's what we're trying to get industry to understand the capability of not only what soldiers who are coming out of Fort Campbell possess, but the spouses that are there that have had to manage the household and I joke around, and I used to say all the time, and I give my wife plenty of credit, she was the operations manager of the Horton household. The easiest thing that most people do is like an old Spartan adage. The easiest thing to do is to go to war. The hardest thing to do is to train for it or to take care of that household as I did go to war. And so how do you reward that and recognize those talents? Their resumes aren't the same. Their resumes don't even look like standard industry procedures, and neither does a soldier's. But do they possess those skills and the aptitude? Absolutely, unequivocally, without a doubt. So the DMDC, or what they call the Defense Manpower Data Center, actually every year, this year they're putting it out uh, for fiscal year uh, 2019. When it comes out, it should be right around June time frame. But this is actually what brought up the 2018. It shows you, based off of here, how many Fort Campbell soldiers that are transitioning out of Fort Campbell, based off of there's the study and the impact that said, hey, there's about 26,000 soldiers that are on Fort Campbell. There's anywhere from 4,800 to 7,000 soldiers that actually leave Fort Campbell. And then it breaks down into what are those MOSs, right? Is it combat arms, like infantry, scouts, tankers? Is it combat service and support, police officers, medics, paramedics, uh, you know, fabricators for the airframe maintenance or maintenance technicians, right? And so with an estimated, based off the DMDC that says there's about 60, 61,000 that stay in Montgomery County alone, there's a reason for that. And so with the amount of soldiers that are leaving Fort Campbell to 7,000, and, and most of them are choosing to stay here, but the challenge is trying to capture more of them to make sure they have a safe landing with a, a good job and a, and a ways to take care of their family as they transition into this community that they love. Uh, and it's one that I chose to stay because of what the community had to offer. So the military spouse, I just said it. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce actually did a survey. Actually, this is in 2018. There was another survey that just came out where the numbers are a lot even higher than this. But it's saying that an estimated 16% are unemployment nationwide. That's their rate of unemployment. Currently, right now, it's anywhere from 2.8 to 3.4% unemployed nationwide. Just normal. 
So if spouses are in a 16 to 18 percent unemployed rate, we can fix that, and that's the purpose of Campbell Strong is to help encourage more industry to hire more spouses, and so that's where we can reimburse that company to hire them by recognizing some of these skill sets. Right? Military spouses find themselves employed part-time, even if they would prefer full-time work. The rate of part-time unemployment among military spouses is 31.6%. Part-time employment on 12,000 spouses at Fort Campbell, do the math on that. That's a lot of spouses that are part-time. And if you even said there's 12,000 spouses and 80% of them are possibly underemployed, what can we do differently as a community to encourage our industrial partners in this community to hire more spouses? Again, my spouse was told she couldn't teach because she had, they had filled too many, too many seats in that education system, she could go to work at Anthony's Pizza. Was that capitalizing on her skill set? Absolutely not. Where are they? 40% of military veterans in the United States retire or transition into one of seven states, Tennessee being number seven. And so I show you these numbers right here to show you based off of Montgomery County zip codes, the talent pool and the quality of the individuals that have chosen to retire here is this right here. And for some of the civilian colleagues that don't actually understand, the SAR First Class E7, the Master Sergeant or First Sergeant E8, or the Command Sergeant Major or Sergeant Major are all senior leaders in the military. They're senior enlisted counterparts, right? And so there's around nine to 10,000 that retired to stay here. So again, if you look at the demographics of the amount of soldiers coming out of Fort Campbell, we should be encouraging more industry to tap into that vital leadership that's transitioning from Fort Campbell and, and be able to harness and make sure that there's 7,000, none of them go unemployed or underrepresented because of a skill set. Then we're gonna talk about the Chief Warrant Officer 4, Chief Warrant Officer 5, right? There's around almost 800 of them that's retiring. Lieutenant Colonel and Colonel, there's around 600 that reside right here. So if you did the math again out of 7,000, let's say there's probably about 100 of those that are trying to transition into the community. And they're not hesitant to drive to a different community an hour away to get a job if it pays more or if there's a better, a better availability of those resources for them. We can, cho we can choose and close that gap much easier if we recognize the amount of talent pool and the amount of numbers of people leaving from Fort Campbell. The economic impact, this is just showing you, and I ran the numbers again, based off of 2018, there's about $25 million a month that is paid out just in retirement income in Montgomery County zip codes alone. So the economic impact of what happens when you choose as a community to hire the veterans to stay into this community, the second and third order effects of that retirement income are unbelievable. It's going to pay for schools, bigger schools, additions of schools, right? Bigger EMS services that's much needed. And so those are some more dollars that are going back in this community as tax revenue. And so it's, a, again, a big reason why the community should come together to recognize the impact and hire more and then start tapping into the spouses. I didn't choose to stay here because of my own volition. My wife chose where we stayed because it met her key traits, good schools, good community, great living opportunities. And then on number four was me. Okay, yes, ma'am, we'll stay here, All right? So recognizing the, the Campbell Strong was stood up with the sole importance of trying to share with what comes out of Fort Campbell and making sure that none of those 7,000 soldiers go without a job or a misunderstanding of what skill sets they may not possess and recognizing the enhanced talents and the steep learning curve Let's try to encourage our industry partners to take advantage the fact that I can pay them to hire each one of those soldiers by reimbursing 50% of their wages for 10 weeks. If we partner with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to use a Hire a Heroes graduate for 12 weeks, they can be placed with the company for free. And then if the company decided to hire them, I will reimburse 50% of their wages for 10 weeks. That's 22 weeks industry does not have to pay but 50% of 10 weeks. Can you imagine what would happen to that company's bottom line if you said, hey, can you just hire 10 veterans from Fort Campbell? Or can you hire 10 spouses from Fort Campbell? Think about the impact that we could encourage more veterans to stay in this community instead of willing to drive an hour away 
or to commute distances because they just don't see the availability of the resources or jobs that are really actively here. We just haven't showed them enough. And so on your desk, there's a flyer that actually shows all of the information of what Fort Campbell Strong is here to do. And we are actually here to help every industrial partner that we could possibly uh, reach. And I encourage you to reach out to your industry in your sectors and talk to those business partners. And small businesses is the exact same capability and possibilities. It's even more uh, capable of helping them a little bit better than it is the bigger companies because overhead for them is a little bit different. And so I encourage you, please, and I thank you for allowing me the time to speak and talk to everybody in the community and what we can do. My contact information is on the back of it, and I'm here to help at all time. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Commissioners, our next item on our agenda, uh, agenda are our zoning resolutions. Our first zoning resolution is CZ2. 2020 application of Matthew Pogue from AG to E1. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Gannon, second Commissioner Butts. Any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? We have 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Next zoning resolution is CZ3 2020, application of Alfred Jones from R3 to EM1. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Lewis, second Commissioner Knight, any discussion? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as I mentioned last week, almost from the uh, moment that the sign went up on this property about the uh, rezoning possibility, my phone started ringing. Uh, the neighborhood in question is uh, a, a bit of a historical neighborhood. Uh, most of the families there can, can trace their, their uh, location to that area for decades, generations. Um, sometime 50 years ago or so, uh, the neighborhood formed a community improvement association. Uh, operates basically kind of like an HOA, although they do not have some of the uh, uh, legislative abilities that you see in an HOA. And I did receive a letter from the Community Improvement Association and some of their points of concern. And uh, if I could briefly just go through this, uh, the approval of this change will aid the South Guthrie community in taking on the appearance of a subpar trailer court community. This is an appearance that we frequently fight to avoid. The lot in question is a low swampy area with no means of drainage and standing water. Even though a septic tank might currently be on the lot, the lot has no occupancy for over 40 years. Therefore, sewage will eventually become an issue. Lastly, it is the understanding of this association that if approved, the owner will move the mobile home where he lives to this lot. His mobile home is currently located in a mobile home park where all the homes there are used and will bring down the property value of any lot in South Guthrie. The South Guthrie Community Improvement Association is not against progress or home ownership for anyone. However, the little gains we have made have not been without struggle, and that is the reason why we stand against anything we view as a setback to future progress. The Community Association asks you to please stand against this zone change. Uh, I received that uh, about three days ago. I have reached out to the board members. I have talked to several of the residents that are members of the association, and they uh, strongly feel that this vote should be a no. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Anyone else to speak regarding CZ3 2020? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? If four yeses, 17 noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioners, now on to our resolutions. Resolution 23-1 is a resolution of Montgomery County Board of Commissioners approving amendments to the 2019-20 school budget. Is there a motion for approval? 
Commissioner Albert, second, Commissioner Bryant, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? We have 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 23-2 is a resolution to charge off debts in Montgomery County Clerk's Office. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Riccone, second Commissioner Creek, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. <clears throat> would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Jackson, would you please tally the vote? 21 <laughs> yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. I'll probably mess up about four more times. That's I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> resolution 23-3 is resolution amending the budget of the Montgomery County Juvenile Court for additional funding to cover the cost of juvenile detention services. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Bill, second Commissioner Keene, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you. Resolution 23-4, resolution of support for the Tennessee Local Education Capital Investment Act, House Bill 0124 and Senate Bill 0198. So motion for approval, Commissioner Rasnick. Second, Commissioner Pritchard. Any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 23-5, resolution of the Montgomery County Commission declaring support of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Butts, second. Commissioner Tangy Smith, any discussion? Commissioner Butts. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Again, I want to echo what was said last week um, by many of us, and I would ask my fellow commissioners to please vote yes on this. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchard. Um, I ask my fellow commissioners not to vote for this, and I will tell you why. Montgomery County is a community. It's a community of diverse people with a great recognition across the nation. At this point in time, politicizing Montgomery County and uh, taking something that is a personal belief of quite a few people and making it into a flag and draping it over Montgomery County to me is not appropriate. This is a community. And I ask my fellow commissioners to remember that we are a community and we're a diverse community of all beliefs and acceptances. And I feel this is not appropriate. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Tangy Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hold here a petition with over 1,300 signatures, a petition that I found out about um, just last week. Um, I'm not sure that I even had 1,300 people to vote in my district, but they came out to sign this petition. This solidifies and confirms for me that this is something that Montgomery County wants. Um, those in support, please stand tonight. These are the people that took the time to come out, to come out. They, they actually left their house to come out to support. Um, thank you. Those who are in um, opposition, please stand. So you're in opposition of something and you, you don't even take the time to come out and, and support and, and show that you're in opposition of it. Um, I would like to remind everyone that myself as an elected official, I'm a public servant of the people. I am their voice. I'm not my own voice. I'm a founder of an organization. And in that organization, that's my voice. That's when I say what Tangi feels. But at this role, this role that I'm serving right now, these are for the citizens of Montgomery County, particularly District 8. This is their voice. I am their voice. 
all citizens, for all the citizens. This transcends uh, party lines. This is unbiased leadership. This is not what I think, this is what the people think and what they want. So I've urged my fellow um, county commissioners to vote yes, because this is what the people want and we are the voice of the people. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Joe Smith. I just wanna say that the number of people who stood up to the number of people who stood up for against it was 99% to 1% by who's in this room, if you look around the room when they were doing it. That's pretty amazing to me. It kind of tells a story that here in Montgomery County, the people who support the Second Amendment come out and they support it full heartedly. All right. I said it last week and I'll say it again this week. We all swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. The Second Amendment is a part of the Constitution, a living, breathing document that we swore an oath to uphold. We're not going back on that. We're not saying that, that certain laws need to be in effect. There already are laws in effect. When a, when a person commits a crime, they get what's called a conditions of release by the judge. Typically on that conditions of release, they're not allowed to have firearms. They're not allowed to have alcohol. They're not allowed to make contact with that person that they had an egregence against. But what this law that, that they're proposing out of Knoxville allows is for somebody to get mad at you and say, hey, I don't like that person. Sheriff or police, can you guys go take their guns away? And as long as they can get a judge to sign off on an order of protection before somebody has even committed a crime, they're gonna be allowed to go take your weapons. That's, it's not right. Second Amendment protects that right from illegal search and seizures. All I can ask is all of my fellow commissioners vote yes tonight to show support out of Montgomery County to the state level that we will not want red flag laws in Tennessee. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Pritchard, I'll come back to you since you've uh, spoken already. Commissioner Knight. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanna say not too many people know that I, I'm not only a county commissioner, but I serve in the Army Reserves as well. And as a matter of fact, I just came back from my weekend training here at uh, Fort Knox, uh, Kentucky. Now, as an Army Reservist, right, I swore an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And that oath doesn't stop when I take off my uniform. That oath continues on. I urge you, commissioners, support our Constitution, support this resolution, and vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchard. What I want to say is that this resolution is just uh, symbolic. This resolution doesn't have any actual teeth. We all have the Constitution to work with. We all believe, a lot of us believe in the Second Amendment. But this resolution is, all it is is symbolism. And I feel like Montgomery County should not be in the business of being symbolic. I think that uh, what we do speaks for itself. Our residents, our uh, uh, companies, and I just feel like this symbolism is unnecessary. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Beal. You are either pro-gun or anti-gun. So if you're anti-gun, vote no. If you're pro-gun, vote for it. So I would like to go ahead and call for the question. Commissioner Harper. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, I wanted to say tonight, you know, we have progressives on our commission. We have conservatives. I consider myself a conservative. One of the nice things about this resolution is I think most of us agree on it. Most all of us agree on it, that it's a good thing. So I'd appreciate your support for it. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchard, this is the last, last time. Yes, sir. Just in response to Commissioner Beal, I'm ex-law enforcement and I am pro-gun. I'm just not pro-symbolism. All right. Oh, it's, if this is back and forth, go, uh, let, uh, if you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? 
Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 18 yeses, three noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 23-6 is a resolution in support of fiscal year 2020 THDA home grant application. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Lewis, second. Commissioner Knight, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 237, resolution to modify distant rules for application of beer laws pursuant to TCA 57-5101. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Johnson, second. Commissioner Harper, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Jackson, would you please tally the vote? I mean, Cottrell, I'm sorry. We have 17 yeses, four noes, and zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 23-8 is a resolution to accept and appropriate funds from donation to Sheriff's Office for Canine Retirement. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Joe Smith, second. Commissioner Chandler, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 23-9, a resolution encouraging the support of legislation which directs 10 care to reimburse ground ambulance providers at a rate not less than the current Medicare fee schedule and adding funding to the 2020-2021 state budget. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Joe Smith, second. Commissioner Chandler, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 2310, a resolution to adopt the pol policy for subrogation claims pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated 8-27507. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Pritchard, second. Commissioner Lewis, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 2311, resolution to establish the authority of, loss of the Loss Control and Budget Joint Committee for risk management purposes. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Johnson, second. Commissioner Gannon, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 19 yeses, two noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 2312 is a resolution amending the budget of the Montgomery County Parks and Rec Recreation Department for naturalists. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Ray, second. Commissioner Rasnick, excuse me. Any discussion? you would please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 20 yeses, zero noes, one abstention. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 2313, resolution to approve prospective lease agreement and for use by Austin Peay State University as tenant at the Multipurpose Event Center. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Keene, second. Commissioner Gannon, any discussion? Commissioner Riccone. Mayor and commissioners, distributed on your desk are two different proposed amendments. I'm going to do them one at a time. We'll address the second one when we get to it. And basically, I'm going to read through the pertinent points of what I propose to be amended. Uh, but the gist is this. 
we have approved the purchase of the land for the multipurpose event center. And, and the short is this allows us to move forward and, allow the, and allows the mayor to move forward with this project. We've approved the purchase of the land. We've actually have approved the bond subject to the finalization of a lease. So here we are trying to move forward. It came up last week and I was kind of surprised when it came up last week. Budget committees looked at this. We're trying to move it forward without delay. We can't have a finalized lease done until the building is complete and plus there's more lag time on things to get done. We have, and it was provided to us, a lease in form and, form and substance with a few minor parts omitted. Number of seats, seat licenses, and those kind of things. And I believe that to be a normal way to proceed. Commissioner Harper, I thought, was right on point when he talked about this was an LOI. And I even think it's stronger than an LOI. I mean, we have a lease in substance with parts to be added in. With this amendment, which I'll read in the points, this will allow us to move forward. I know Austin P is moving forward with getting all the requirements on their side done, but this is gonna take a process. And if we wait four months, five months, six months, then we're four months, five months, six months behind our construction. And we're just delaying and delaying. I have full faith in our government and this body, and I know we want to move forward with this project, and I don't wanna let something like filling in the number of seats in the arena that you won't know till it's built slow us down and let us lose another six months and maybe lose an entire basketball season for Austin P or a whole event uh, season for the for the uh, multi-purpose event center so I ask you to support this on the amendment to 2313 looking on page two and it's it's in red so the whereas that's in red the original reg resolution 19 Eleven six authorizing the issuance of bonds for the project was amended to include notwithstanding anything herein to the contrary no bond shall be issued pursuant to this resolution until the county or the sports authority as applicable enters into a fully executed lease agreement for the with the primary tenant for the multi-purpose event center comprising part of the projects called the event center related to the use of the event center and I, I agreement with the facility manager related to the management of the event center and is where we're adding whereas Montgomery County wishes to issue the bonds and this will allow us to move forward based upon the mutual agreements of Montgomery County and Austin P State University exhibited here too and which Austin P State University has already su has submitted to the appropriate state agencies for approval as set out herein and they are moving forward and it's just a process and so I want us to continue moving when you look in the next whereas I'm basically just trying to change out the the contracts being finalized before we can move forward and again last now therefore be it resolved the Montgomery County Commission approves the lease and its terms as stated therein as to the lease premises and likewise approves the license of the arena in the stated terms of general occupancy use of the arena revenues to be shared and authorizes the mayor to issue and sell bonds earlier approved and further then move forward with the completion of other terms or revisions of the other terms as may be necessary along with Austin P State University to the exhibit as approved as approval of the state of Tennessee is sought and again y'all can read this it basically says we're going to move forward we're not going to delay we're not going to sit on property that's vacant we're not going to lose time constructing this arena we're going to get it done and I'd ask that you support that is that in the form of an amendment that is in the form of, a, of an amendment is there a second? second. Commissioner Harper. Okay, so we are now gonna vote on the amendment and as you're queuing that machine up, Ms. Cottrell. Commissioner Bill, you speaking on the amendment, I presume. I, I think I am. Um, I was going to ask what is the legal definition of fully executed? I was going to ask that but before the amendment was proposed. Okay. I don't I don't know if that's still in the language anywhere. I don't know if it was cut. I just know what uh, Commissioner Raccone has provided and, sh and read to us, but I don't know if you want to address. I don't know where it is. I don't know where it is either, but fully executed is, is near uh, wherever you find it in there. If, if it's in the mandate granting authority to the mayor to execute the final lease where is it no the words fully executed was in the amendment that we passed back in November to the bond resolution 
Right. Fully executed means a completely executed document. Fully, if, if four parties had to sign, to be fully executed, all four parties have signed. That would be the a working definition of fully executed. Okay. okay, so passing this, would this not contradict what we passed in November? It, it, if you look at the amendment, the purpose of yeah. the amendment says that language previously would have required that. Mm -hmm. But the commission is, is now moving to go forward without that requirement of a lease in place based upon the, 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 the other language in there where it says you've got a term agreement You've got a lease agreement, you've got significant terms that are in place and will not change unless if they do change, he will have to come back for the final approval. So yes, it is substitution. So we're basically undoing what we did in November. You are. So that we can move forward. Okay, thank you. Yes. Commissioner Gannon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I'm talking to the amendment and to both, but basically I wanted to to say that I was the original one that brought up that we should make sure to have contracts and stuff like that, to have that amendment in there. Um, the intent of it was is to make sure that all the big stuff was done and that the, the citizens wouldn't left holding the bag, if you will, and to make sure that we had everything in place. It was not to stop the building of the, the multi-purpose event center for the minor things, how many seats or the seat licenses or how many games is Austin P gonna play and those things. To, I feel that the intent of that amendment has been met by our how much Austin P is going to sign. They, their board has voted on it and everything else. We have a memorandum of understanding or a letter of intent, whichever one you want to call it. So I think that all the big things in the contract have been done, and I think our due diligence has been done, and we have served our constituents to make sure that, that everything is going to go correctly, as we have said all along. So I urge everyone to vote for the amendment and for the uh, resolution as well. Any other discussion? We're now voting on the amendment to 2313. If you would, please register your vote. Does anyone want to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 18 yeses, three noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. We're now voting on 2313 as amended. Are y'all ready? Just a second. Okay. I wasn't trying to pressure you. It's all good. If you, if, if you would, I guess register your vote. That's what you're doing. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 18 yeses, three noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Resolution 2314 is a resolution to approve management agreement with Powers Management for the Multipurpose Event Center. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Gannon, second. Commissioner Johnson, any discussion? Commissioner Riccone? Uh, commissioners, I also, I mean, I'm I'm not going to restate everything I said before. I have outlined or provided uh, an amendment. The changes are again in red to make it easier to track. The first whereas that's being changed, we're <coughs> basically referring to the previous resolution that required fully executed, and we're replacing that with whereas Montgomery County wishes to issue the bonds based upon the mutual agreements of powers management in Montgomery County exhibited here too, so that bonds may be issued and sold. And again, this allows the mayor to move forward so we're not sitting here fighting over the small minutia. Everything has been provided to us. We just have some blanks to fill in, but again, this keeps us moving so we can hit our projected dates, and I'd ask that you support it. You, you submitting that in the form I'm, of an amendment? I'm submitting that in the form of an amendment. Would you care to read the now, therefore, be it resolved, please, sir? I sure will. Thank you, Mayor. Now, therefore, and this is as this is what I propose to be amended. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners assembled in regular business session on the ninth day of March 2020 
that the attacks exhibit, exhibited agreement of significant terms with powers management in Montgomery County, Tennessee is complete in all principal terms and therefore approved and authorizes the mayor to cost the, the issuance and sale of bonds and then further complete and revise and move the exhibited terms to final. All major terms already in place and to final all major terms already in place and then may be executed by him for the ultimate management of the multipurpose event center. Is there a second? Commissioner Gannon, any discussion? If you would, please register your vote oh, on the motion to amend. Thank you. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 18 yeses, three noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. We're now voting on resolution 2314 as amended. Any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Does anyone want to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? Just as clarification, do we need another motion on the original or does the motion on the amendment stand? I thought we did a motion on the original uh, 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 when we came back. I, I, I may have missed it. I think Mr. Riccone made the motion to amend. I think it was seconded by Mr. Gannon. Gannon. I think Mr. Gannon made the, as amended, mm -hmm. I think he made the motion. I don't remember who made the second. And we had a vote on the motion. Right. I had um, Mr. Riccone, Mr. Gannon on the amendment. I wasn't sure if we needed another or is that. Well, we, we can go back. Is there, is there a motion to approve resolution 2314 as amended? Commissioner Bryant, second. Commissioner Lewis, any discussion? I could have skipped it. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. If you would, I please apologize. register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 18 yeses, three noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioners, under old business, resolution 22-4 is a resolution to amend the inmate medical budgets for the Montgomery County Jail and the Montgomery County Workhouse for fiscal year 2020. Uh, before I ask for a motion, I, I was asked uh, a couple of things at our informal meeting. Uh, it's my understanding from accounts and budgets that uh, from a budget standpoint uh, that the jail budget will be okay until the 1st of May. Uh, so th that will tell you one thing. The second thing I'd like to report is that uh, there has been a lot of conversation back and forth uh, between uh, myself and the sheriff, sheriff staff, uh, risk management staff. Mr. Harvey's been involved in it. Mr. Johnson, there has been a lot of conversation back and forth. Um, and there's been some conversation with the vendor. I, I think it'd be fair to say they hadn't responded as quickly as we've wanted to, but. Yeah, I would say we haven't got the responses that we were looking for. Not, not at this point. So um, I will give you that bit of information. And is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Pritchard, is there a second? Commissioner Riccone, Commissioner Joe, any discussion? Looks like it's some. Commissioner Joe Smith. I would say that since the budget will be good until May, we should defer one more month and try to get the answers from that vendor. Uh, if we're not getting the services that we expect and we're still paying their bill, something needs to be done about it. Commissioner Leverett. Mayor, I also would like to um, defer this, not deferring it for the, just the sake of deferring it, but I think before this body, you makes a decision, like I said last week, we do have a responsibility to at least make an informed decision. 
And um, with the sheriff being the CEO of the jail, we need to also get some answers um, from the sheriff, let us know what's going on, but we also need some answers from that vendor. And before we just throw money at a problem, I think we need to defer at least another 30 days to make sure that we have all the answers that we need. That's Is all. that a motion to defer? Yes. I think he made a motion already. Well, we'll have a motion by Commissioner Leverett to okay. defer 22-4 to our, our next regular scheduled meeting, yes, which is? April 13th. April 13th. That's the f uh, formal when we vote. Okay, and we have a second, Commissioner Harper. So, Commissioner Bill, do you wanna speak on the deferral? Yes, sir, but I did have a question. Are we confident that we're gonna have the information that we need by our meeting next month? I, I can't say that we are. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, because I would, I would also recommend that we defer it another month to get more information. Commissioner Harbor, do you want to speak to the deferral? I do. Okay. I, would, I spoke rather vividly last week about my disappointment with all of this. I have the same disappointment. One of the things I would hope is that we have enough information, like Commissioner Leverett just stated, to make a reasonable decision. At this point, without the information, I can tell you what my vote is, because I'm pretty livid about it. I thank you for your support. Commissioner Knight. I was actually gonna make the recommendation from last week, which was to, de to defer, but I see everybody's gone to that consensus, consensus uh, now, so let's go ahead and defer. Okay. Commissioner Lebert, do you wanna speak to the deferral since you made the motion? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I don't know if this. If, just tell me if it's not, because I'm not sure. Is this the proper place to to say that we will probably need to have a special called meeting for the jail and juvenile committee as well? Uh, I don't think this is the place to okay. ask that. Okay. But I, th I okay. think you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you. So we have a motion and a second to defer resolution 22-4 until April 13th, which is our next regular our next formal commission meeting so, commissioner Raconi, would you like to speak to the deferral just just quickly and you know like i said before we never met a deferral we didn't like so we're going to defer it but i would <laughs> like to know uh for the sheriff's budget because i'm assuming you're still paying for met for inmate meds you didn't stop that's correct so and, and, and this overage right here is a bill for services that were already provided. Okay. So you're still able to operate, or do we need to? If yes, we're, we're fine through May. I, I you know, lean towards uh, Jeff and accounts and budgets to that, but if he says that, that we're fine with that, then we're fine with that. It's a bill that our provider paid, and we have to reimburse them. So there's some questions related to those bills that is what we're looking for the answers for. So uh, that's where we're at. And uh, I would just... Uh, Want to want the commission to know that there's a whole lot of intricacies in this that uh, that we're learning as well, and we hope to work that out with this vendor. But we haven't. I just want to make sure that we haven't put your budget in jeopardy or no, sir. I mean, it can sit in their lap until till we pay the bill until we get our questions answered. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Any other discussion? So we are now voting uh, to defer on resolution 22-4 to defer it again until uh, our April 13th meeting. If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change their vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Cottrell, would you, would, would you like to read the clerk's report? Comes Teresa Cottrell, Chief Deputy Clerk, on behalf of Kelly A. Jackson, County Clerk, Montgomery County, Tennessee, and presents the County Clerk's Report for the month of February 2020. I hereby request that the persons named on the list of new applicants to the Office of Notary Public be elected. The oaths of Deputy County Official and Judicial Commissioner be approved as taken. The report shall be spread upon the minutes of the Board of County Commissioners this ninth day of March 2020. There are no names to be read into the minutes for bond purposes, and you received your notaries at last week's meeting, and there were none signed by personal surety. Is there a motion to approve the clerk's report? Commissioner Bill, second Commissioner Leverett, 
Any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 21 yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioners, you'll see under your reports filed, reports five, six, and seven are new from our informal session. A specific notice to re, uh, number seven, the report on the debt obligation, which is a requirement of the state. Next item on our agenda is the county mayor nominations and appointments. Without objection, uh, all of these require commission approval, so I'll read the nominations first. Uh, under public building authority, we have two. Uh, Tim Harvey is nominated to fill the unexpired term of Brown Harvey Jr., who resigned his position with term to expire December of 2020. And judicial <laughs> commissioners Joe Papastasis, part-time, is eligible for reappointment for a one-year term to expire March 2021. Is there a motion for approval for the county mayor nominations? Commissioner Rasnick, second Commissioner Knight, any discussion? You would, I, and without objection, I'm going to read the appointments too. I probably didn't do that right, but that's the way you've got them set up to vote. So just hold on voting. Public safety, these are the county mayor appointments, public safety training complex committee. Commissioner Keene, as chair of the EMS committee, appointed to a one-year term to expire February 2021. Commissioner David Harper is a chair of the fire protection committee appointed for a one-year term to expire February 2021, and Commissioner Leverett as chair of the Jail and Juvenile Detention Committee, appointed for a one-year term to expire February 2021. And I think, uh, who first, who, Commissioner Knight, who seconded? Commissioner Rasnick, would y'all, okay, Commissioner Rasnick, would you agree to your still motion to accept both? Commissioner Knight, you good as well? Ms. Cottrell, you good? Yes. Any discussion? If you would, please register your vote. Would anyone like to change your vote? Ms. Cottrell, would you please tally the vote? 19 yeses, zero noes, two abstentions. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioners, just a couple of announcements. Uh, just Please be reminded that you're invited to, the, to attend the Fredonia Park ribbon cutting taking place on Wednesday, April 1st at 3 o'clock p.m. The address is 4650 Old Ashland City Road South. I was out there about a week ago and that's gonna be a marvelous facility for that community. So I would encourage your attendance. And also on your desk, uh, some of you ask us to put another pledge form uh, on uh, on your desk, so you, there's still an opportunity if you would like to give to United Way uh, to do that. And also there's a 4-H chili dinner, chili lunch, when is it? March what? March 20th at, at Civic Hall at, so March 20th at Civic Hall, there's a 4-H chili luncheon. It's a fundraiser for 4-H. I'm sure if you're there at 11, they'll sell you some chili. So uh, that's all of our business for this evening. I will, what? Oh, thank you. And please be on the lookout in your mailboxes. Next week, you'll get your census uh, data. So it's very, very important for Montgomery County, for the city of Clarksville, for this whole area. So I encourage you to fill out the census. And with that being said, I'll ask our sheriff to adjourn us. All rise. Oh, yes, oh, yes, this honorable board of county commissioners now stands adjourned. Now may God save this state and this honorable board of county commissioners.